Hello, my name is Tim Newdecker with MC Services, and I'm here today to talk about FileMaker Pro calculations. I've been a professional FileMaker Pro developer since 1991. Half of that time I spent as an in-house developer working on projects for large companies, and for the last 16, 17 years I have been a consultant working for various consulting firms. In that time, I've worked with thousands of FileMaker Pro solutions, and I've helped many developers earn their FileMaker Pro certification. I have done over 15 sessions at various FileMaker Pro conferences, including Pause on Errors, FileMaker Pro Developers Conference, and now Claris Engage. So what I'd like to do today is not go through slides with you about calculations, but actually open up FileMaker and look at live calculations and systems and see how they work and understand the way the FileMaker Pro Calc Engine works with what we tell it to do. Calculations in FileMaker Pro are used for more than just field definitions. They can also be used for the validations on fields, auto enter values on fields. Scripts rely heavily on calculations especially for the set field, set variable functions, all your control steps, exit loop if, if statements, etc. cetera. Um, indexing on global variables and regular variables and normal fields when you make arrays. All your dynamic navigation uses calculations, script parameters, and of course security in FileMaker Pro is a large use of calculations. And displaying objects on layouts can use calculations for the hide show functions. Content for web viewers is controlled by calculations. And of course, plugin usage. One of the tools that FileMaker gives us to work with calculations is called the Data Viewer. And it's kind of a mini place to test out calculations on the Watch tab. And if you don't have a Data Viewer in your FileMaker Pro, you can turn it on by going to the Preferences in FileMaker Pro, and down below, turn on the Use Advanced Tools. Then this menu will appear, and you can turn on the Data Viewer. And when you're in the Data Viewer, you can make your own calculations, and you can make adjustments to them, and see the results in real time. On the left-hand side, you have a list of all the tables in your database and related databases. So you can select fields and place them in your calculations. Over here, you have a list of all of the functions in FileMaker Pro organized by their category of what they work with. So you have number functions, date functions, and then you have some basic operators over here, quoting for literal strings, parentheses for controlling your order of operations, concatenation, return symbols, logic functions, basic math functions, and more logic functions. You can select a function, and you get a short description down below about it. But one of the really powerful features a lot of folks don't know about is this little question mark right here. If I click that question mark, FileMaker Pro looks at what function you have selected and opens up the help page documentation for that function so you can read in detail about that function, get examples, and see other functions that are related to it. And that is just wonderful when you're going through because the magic for learning FileMaker Pro fun calculations and functions is not memorizing every function and all the parameters for it. That's really hard. There's a lot of FileMaker Pro functions. But if you know every function that exists, you may not have to know exactly what the parameters are and exactly how to use it. But if you know there's a function that can turn three numbers into a date, then when you need it, you can come and get that function and hit this question mark and read the documentation and learn how to use it when you need it. But if you don't know it exists, you won't use it. Recently, I was working on a client system in Chicago, and they were complaining that the system was running slow. And when I started digging through the system, and it was very oddly developed. And this previous developer had actually written a 300 line script to do pattern count. 
because I can only assume the developer did not know the pattern count function existed within FileMaker Pro. So they had spent the time to create their own, and their own was very slow. And I started replacing that function with the FileMaker pattern count function, and you wouldn't believe how fast their solution became. So knowing the functions exist is the real power in FileMaker Pro calculations. They can do just about anything you can think of, but to be able to implement them, you have to know what tools you have at your disposal. So I highly recommend you go through the man pages and spend a couple hours one day just reading all the functions and their basic description. And once you kind of have those seeds planted in your mind, as you're doing other work, you'll go, oh, there's a function out there that will help me chop off these end digits for me instead of rounding them. And you can go look up that function and find it and use it. So today, instead of using the data viewer or the FileMaker Pro defined fields, I have actually created a database that contains calculations. You're looking at just about every field in this database on this layout. I have a text field for typing in a calculation. I have some data fields, some number fields, some date fields, some time fields, and some text fields that we can put information into. And then down below, we have the results. But notice I have two results, a number result and a text result. And the reason for that is when you make a calculation, you have to tell FileMaker what kind of data you expect as a result for that function. So if we look at this field, result underscore num, and I come in down below, I'm telling FileMaker Pro in this drop down menu that I expect this function to give me a number. Okay. Now the function I'm using is something called the evaluate. Evaluate takes a text string, in this case, the contents of the field called calc, and it tries to evaluate that text string as if it were a FileMaker Pro calculation and tell you what the answer is. So in effect, I've redirected our calculation into a database field so we can do find, sort, searches, and flip through records of calculations so we're not having to porpoise in and out of dialog boxes during our presentation today. Now, the second parameter in Evaluate are what are known as trigger fields. This, I have told FileMaker Pro, hey, watch all the data entry fields in the calc field, and anytime one of those fields is edited, update the contents of my result field. So my first result field gives us the answer in number, and the second result field gives us the answers if it were text. We could also choose date, time, timestamp, container, but for today's purposes, we're just going to work with text and number results. Okay, so let's take a look at our first calculation in this demo. I have number field set to 6, number field 2 set to 9, and I have the max function looking at those two fields, and the result is 9. And we get the same result if we ask for it in text. So when you take a number and you ask for it in text, it just tries to convert the number to text for us. Makes it very easy. Our second calculation, we're using something called the choose function. What do we think this result would be? Choose one. One, two, three, four. So the choose function lets you pick something from a list of items. And in this case, we're asking choose to give us item number one. So any normal FileMaker Pro developer would think, hey, one, our result's gonna be the text string one. But lo and behold, we get two. That's kind of weird. Well, in a lot of other programming languages, counting actually starts at zero. So zero, this result right here is zero. This one is one, this is two, this is three. A use for this function, might be to convert options. Hey, how well did you like your sales representative today from one to 10? And they pick a number from one to 10, or the words, I didn't like them, I did like them, they were okay, they were wonderful. 
and you can convert those words into numbers and text and swap them back and forth. So this is a, a great little function for doing that kind of work. Our next function is the exact function. And it's comparing text field ABC to ABC. And the exact function is case sensitive. So it asks, is text field equal or exactly the same as text field two? And notice when I say equal, it's not the traditional equal. So this is zero because they're not the same and it's case sensitive. If I come in here and put a lowercase a in there, and we look over here, now it's a one. They are exactly the same. But what? why is that different than the equal sign? So I'm going to comment out that function to come down here, and we're going to go take these two, and we're going to put them down here, and I'm going to put an equal sign. This is how most folks test to see if two fields are equal. And notice they are equal right there, but if I come back over and I change this to a capital A, they're still equal. The normal equal sign is not case sensitive. So we use the exact function. So maybe you're testing passwords or something else and you need to know if they are exactly the same. That's what the exact function is all about. Pattern count. We were talking about this one early in our presentation. Pattern count is a fun one. So what it does is it takes some text and it searches for another string inside of it. And the pattern count function is not case sensitive. So I can put in a, a notice we're finding an uppercase TH and another uppercase TH and we're searching for lowercase TH. I could change this to uppercase and we still get the same result. Now if I put an A after the end, it only finds that one time because it's only there once, THI. So that's pattern count. Okay, so here's a tricky pattern count. Let's think about this one. How many times does one one appear in the string one one one? This one, can be tricky. So we, we, we see there's a 1-1 one, one right there, but there's another 1-1 one, one right there. And so I guess the real question is, is does pattern count count this middle one in both strings? Well, no it doesn't. So what pattern count does is it finds the first 1-1, one, one, then it goes to the end of it and it starts looking for the next 1-1 one, one, and it doesn't find one. So that's why we only get a result of one. If I add another one in there, now it goes up to two. See that, because we have one, one, then it starts counting again, one, one again. Okay, floor. A lot of people don't use the floor and ceiling functions. They're closely related. Um, they do show up on the FileMaker certification test quite regularly, so I, I recommend if you're going to become certified, you do learn these functions. So what does the floor function do? Well, it looks at a number that has a decimal and it takes you to the next lower integer, an integer being a whole number without any decimals. So in this case, think of it as dropping the, uh, the trailing dot five and we get a one. But it can get tricky. What if we do floor minus 1.5? Well, our definition of floor should go to the next lower integer. So what's the next lower integer from minus 1.5? Minus 2, because that is minus 2 is lower than minus 1.5, and it is the next integer. Ceiling is just like floor, but it goes the other direction. It goes to the next highest integer. So the next higher integer from minus 1.5, minus 1. So you got to be careful when there's negative signs in there of what, what they're doing. So what would we do with a floor? What's a re real world example of using the floor function? Well, here's an interesting calculation that I see in a lot of systems. <clears throat> it's taking the date field, in this case, 8-5-2020. It's extracting the month from the date field. That's what this function does. And what month is in there? Eight. So we have the number eight. 
and it's dividing it by three and then taking the ceiling of it. So <clears throat> what are we doing there? So eight divided by three is 2.66666 repeating. And then it takes the ceiling, so it goes up to three. And that actually tells us what quarter a month is in. So if I were to change this eight right here to a 12, we get four. We're in the fourth quarter then. So there's a real world application of the ceiling function for you. Okay, num field plus num field. What are we gonna get here? Oh, you see what's going on over here, do you? Look at that. So we have 2.0 right here, but what is that right there? What's going on there? Well, turns out that's not a zero. That's the letter O. Uh, what's gonna happen? What's the math engine do when we have letters in a text, in a number field? Well, FileMaker Pro tries to make life easy for us. So it simply ignores non-numbers in a number field. You can put them in there. And if you wanted in field definitions, you could tell FileMaker not to prevent, not to allow a user to type in those O's, but to type, force them to put all numerical stuff in. But in this case, we don't have that turned on. So FileMaker just ignores it. So it's as if it's 1.5 plus 2.0, 2.0. Tripping myself up. Okay, so what does FileMaker do with this one then? The the period is a valid symbol and a number, but there's two of them. So what's going on there? You'll find a lot of version numbers defined this way for software. And so what's FileMaker Pro gonna do here? Well, it sees that first period and goes, okay, it's a number, and you can have a period, that's fine. And then, whoa, there's another one. Well, I'm going to ignore that because that one's now considered text. We already have one period, and a number can only have a single period. So this, whatever comes after that one in a way of periods is just ignored as if it were text. So it becomes 4.56. Okay, truncate. Anybody familiar with the truncate function? This one, unlike round, just simply chops off all the decimals after the digit you tell it. So we said, hey, go out four decimal points and drop everything else. Just chop them off. And that's exactly what it did. But there's some magic you can do with a truncate. Um, if we ask it to truncate more decimals than are there, it doesn't mind. It, it can, it'll chop off, chop off ending zeros or nulls. doesn't mind. But what if we put a negative in for the number of decimal points we want to chop off? Boy, what's it going to do there? Well, this one's really nice for formatting. Negative tells it to go to the left of the decimal point. And it doesn't just chop them off. It actually just sets them to zero. It says, hey, those digits are meaningless to me, but I need to keep the scale of my number. So it makes for nice round numbers. And this is great for some reporting and things like that, where you just want to get rid of all the decimals and all the other stuff, you can use negatives in the truncate function. Pi. Well, that simply returns the value of pi. <clears throat> and this leads us to how precise is the FileMaker Pro math engine? Well, by default, the FileMaker math engine goes out to 14 decimals. So if I click in the field, I can actually see all those decimals in my field. If you need FileMaker Pro to have more precision, you can use the set precision function and you can get as large a slice of pi as you would like. In this case, 20 decimals. You could even make that 200 and see 200 digits of pi. You can go as far as 400 decimal points of precision with the math engine and FileMaker. And this is wonderful if you're doing some very precise work and you need all those decimal points. Just remember that the more precision you wrap around your functions or individual parts, the slower you could make your system. 
Now, a lot of computers today are very fast and probably won't even notice this. But back in the day before we had these fast computers, this was a, a great way to slow down a machine, set it to 400 precision and do some really complex math. What is this one going to do? This is a, oh, look at this. We're taking a text field and we're doing math with it. So we learned what happened when we had text in a number field before. FileMaker ignored that text. But what happens when we have numbers in a text field and we do math with them? Well, the same thing. When we took that text field and as soon as we put a plus sign after it, FileMaker says, oh, you're doing math with this? I'm going to treat your text field as if it were a number field. And if it were a number field, it would just ignore the ABC. So it just strips that out and does 123 plus 5, 128. What about this one? This looks like the same math we just did. ABC 123 plus 1. Oh, you notice the quotes around it. Well, the quotes are actually a function in FileMaker Pro. And they tell FileMaker, hey, don't do anything with inside these quotes. This, this is literal text. Just treat it as if it were text. And it just gives us that result. OK, so sometimes we need to quote text. What if we want quotes in our text and it's already quoted? Well, we can use the quote function to wrap quotes around text. And in this case, we get a strange looking result. All of a sudden, the slash appears. Well, the slash is an escape character for FileMaker Pro. And what does that mean, escape character? That is the function that tells FileMaker, hey, I know the quote is a function for literal strings, but I want you to treat it as if it were text. So when you put in that backslash, it tells FileMaker, don't treat that quote as a quote. Just take it as if it's a letter somebody typed and just put it out, and it escapes it. So let's take that to a higher level. So what if we have slashes and quotes in our text string that we want to have quoted? Well, things start to get hairy, and you'll probably never run into this unless you start working with URLs and text fields and start doing math with them or file pathways that involve backslashes. So notice in the middle where we had the slash in our text we're putting in and we asked it to quote it. So that's represented by this. So the escape escapes the next escape. It says, hey, don't treat that escape as an escape. Take it as a string. And that's what makes this right here. And then we have to escape that quote because we're not using it as a function. So there's another escape in that quote and so on. So this can go on forever with quotes and escapes and all that fun stuff. But this is the magic to getting your file pathways to work well. But you don't actually have to learn where to put all those escapes and stuff. What you can do is type your text into a text field where it's just treated as text, and then use the quote function, and FileMaker will take care of all the escaping for you to get it quoted just right. So the quote function. Text format remove. Ah, this one's a favorite. This is usually most new developers, this is one of the first functions they learn because they'll make a database and people will cut and paste data into their database, particularly email addresses, which always come in blue. And they just look terrible. They, they, they come in like this and they mess up the formatting on your layouts. So we have this great function called text format remove. And notice for number, it's like, hey, that's not a number. I don't know what to do with it. So we get an error result, an invalid result. But notice we're not getting all of that text. So if we use a field like this, it normally brings over all that text for us. And we don't want it in that color. Okay. So one of the other magic tricks you can do, I'm going to copy this text to my clipboard. And I'm going to come down here to text field 2, and I'm going to paste it in. I just did a command V on my Macintosh, and I pasted that text in. Right after I paste it in, if I do an undo command, in this case, command Z, control Z on Windows, 
the first thing FileMaker does is a text format removed to the text. If I do another undo, then it removes the pasting that I did. So if you're not using this as a formula, you can paste it in and then undo it. So there's another trick to remove your text formatting. So text format remove, it's frequently used in auto enter calculations for fields so that whenever a user types in data, it auto strips it. And let, let, let's take a look at that. I'm gonna go to manage database <clears throat> and I wanna look at the comment field. And in the comment field right here, I place that text format remove. And then I use another function that we haven't spoken about called self. Self is a shortcut to say me. And what does me mean? Me is this calculation field. So this says, hey, do text format remove of whatever I am. And the reason we have self is so that that function is portable. It can be moved around in the database without having to change what it's referring to. So it could be a calculation field, it could be a layout, all kinds of fun things. So self is a good function to learn. But in this case, I have it in an auto enter calculation. So whenever we edit this field, it's going to evaluate that function and set this field to it. So it's gonna take whatever's in the field, run it through the text format remove and put it back in the field. And I uncheck this box that says, do not replace existing value. So if there's text in the field, it replaces whatever's already in the field, which is exactly what we want to do. So I'm going to say, okay, say, okay. And I'm going to copy my colored text and I'm going to go down here and I'm going to paste in that colored text. And as soon as I click out of that field to save its contents, it runs the text format remove for me. So you can set up fields to automatically do this. So whenever your user cuts and pastes an email address in or a block from Google, all that weird font sizing and color and all that fun stuff gets stripped right out of it. Great form function, text format remove. Trim all, this is another great one for cleaning up text. The trim all function removes extra spaces. And there's about 16 different versions of this function you can run. And you do it with parameters up top. But first, let's look at our data going in. We have a bunch of extra spaces at the end. We have extra spaces between words. We have extra spaces at the beginning. And if we do the trim all, it actually gets rid of all those extra spaces for us. Um, I highly recommend reading the documentation on this. But the basic parameters you pretty much will always pass to it are zero colon zero. If you're working in other character sets or languages other than English, you'll want to start reading about the other parameters where you can specify. So it will work with Cyrillic fonts and kanji and Japanese Chinese fonts and languages. And they have different size spaces and you can tell when to add and remove spaces and all this kind of fun stuff for those other languages. But for English, zero, zero is usually your best bet. Trim all. Value count text field. So the word value has a very special meaning in the FileMaker Pro. And if you think about other places you've heard the word value in FileMaker Pro, think of value list. A value list is a return separated list of items that you can pick a value from. And a value is usually one line. Okay, so if we look over here at this text field, it actually has four lines of items, and each of those items is considered a value. Even though it has multiple words, that is still one value. So a value is a string of text with a return. So here's our return symbol between first and second value, second and third, third and fourth, and the last one doesn't have a trailing return. So we have four values there. So how many values are here? That's five. It just happens that our second value is null. 
there's still a return there, but there's no leading text. So that's also considered a value. Okay, so blank lines when followed by text are counted. Wait a minute, why did I put that weird clause in there when followed by text? Well, if we look at this one, here are some returns at the end of this string, right? Five values again. One, two, three, four. Where's my next one? Well, there's a return right there, and it's followed by another return. So there's two extra returns in here. Well, it turns out, as we learned before, the return followed by text, in this case another return, is considered a value. So there's a null value after John, but it doesn't count this trailing return down here because there's no text after it. So that's why we still have five in this one. Okay, so what's going on with this one? Oh, it's the same thing, but we have two blank ones at the end of this one. See those? So now we go to six. Okay. Well, what if we took this string as a bunch of returns at the end of it, but we're doing a left word. Left words? What are we doing with left words? Nine, 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 nine. That seems like an arbitrary number. Well, there's a funny little thing the left words function can do for us. When you do left words and you do a really big number after it, FileMaker goes and gets all the words, but FileMaker doesn't consider trailing returns as words. So in effect, it gets just that and does a value count on that, which is one, two, three, four, five. And now we get five. So the left words is a great way to strip out trailing returns if you ever need to. Sometimes when you're inserting values and deleting values and building your own value lists, you end up with extra returns getting littered around in your program, in your data. And you can use this left words to strip out those trailing returns. Um, sometimes people put extra returns at the end of a data entry field. If you've forgotten to set return key as one of the symbols to go to the next field, somebody might type in a first name and hit return. So you have Tim return, and then you start doing math with that to build a full name, and you got a return in the middle of your name. So you can use this left words 99999 to strip out those trailing returns. And you could even put it in an auto enter and strip it out automatically when people type it in. So left words with a big number, strip out those trailing returns. So we were talking about how value lists use values. We can also use value lists with one of our design functions. This is a category of functions in FileMaker Pro that let the database look at itself, not its data, but its actual programming. So design functions let you at the programming. And then, so in this case, I'm using a value list function and it has two parameters. It wants to know what file you want to look at and what value list you want. In this case, I use a get function, which is a category of functions that tell you current information about your database. In this case, it tells us the name of the file. And so we use the get function to get our current file name, and we asked it for a value list, my list. And if we look down here, we see there's a value list called Tim was my list that contains Tim was here. And if I go up to file, manage, value lists, I see, hey, there's my list, and it has three values, Tim was here, happy days. So I can put those in there, say okay, and if we look down here again, we now see those values have been added to the result of our calculation. So it actually is looking at the current value list. So you can use this to see what new values have been entered into a value list if you allow editing a value list. But maybe that value list is based on the contents of a field. So now you have a get distinct function for FileMaker Pro. 
So you don't have to use the execute SQL to get distinct values in a related value list or in a field. The case function. Ah, this is a fun one. So the case function is kind of like an if function. It performs a test, and if the test is true, it returns a result. And in this case, we have how many tests here? One, two, three, four tests. Each of them have a result value. And then we have a catch-all that says, hey, if none of these are true, return this value. So is our first test true, num field equal five? Why, yes, it does. So our result should be num one. So if we look down below, we see num one. What I really want to express here, the case statement, folks will get on pretty quick. It's pretty common, pretty powerful. But there's some magic to how FileMaker Pro works with FileMaker math, particularly around the case function. FileMaker does something called short circuiting. It knows that, hey, when it hit this first true value and it's giving this answer, FileMaker's Pro never even looks at this part of the calculation while it's evaluating it because it's already found the answer it needs to return. So what does this mean to us? It means that if we change the order of our calculations, the predicates, the tests, so that the most common values that might hit are up towards the top of the calculation, the calculation will be quicker because they'll never have to do this test or this test or this test. So maybe some of these tests are very slow. Maybe they look at related data. Maybe they do a formula with a precision set to 400. You can set it up so the FileMaker Pro can hit the fast results first and then do the slow stuff if that works with your logic. And that can make your databases tremendously faster when you're working with large data sets or you're doing a calculation a bunch of times. So just think, if you have a million records in your database and you have to do this calculation a million times, well, if you can prevent it from doing the slow part half of the time, you can make a tremendous speed improvement in your database. So order of operations is very important. The let function is another way to speed up files as well as make calculations easier to read. A let function lets you do repetitive calculations one time instead of multiple times and speed things up. So here we take x, we set some variables. So the let function has two parts. The first part is a variable declaration, which is inside the square brackets. I set a variable x to three and y equals number field. And then you have a function that uses those variables to give you a result. In this case, it's y plus x plus y. Now, num field might be very slow. It might be a great big calculation, you know, left, right, middle, square root, tangent, something that's very slow, and you need to do two things with it once you have it. So if we define it into a variable first, FileMaker Pro runs that slow function one time right up here instead of doing it twice here and here. So we've, in effect, made our calculation almost twice as fast. Also, it's a heck of a lot easier to read the function this way than it is the other way. But what's a real world example? So here's another one where we defined x twice. Uh-oh, what's going to happen here? So we said x equals 1. Then we said y equals num field plus x. So that's uh, 6 plus 1, so that's 7. But then we said x equals 3. Uh-oh, so does our 7 turn into 9? Nope, FileMaker works top-down. So you can redefine a variable after you've used it one time. Maybe you need to change something and then redefine it. So you could actually programmatically change that variable as you're working, and it does it in a procedural top-down method. So it makes it very handy. And the last value is the one that's used in the calculation down at the bottom. In this case, 7 plus 3 equals 10.
So there are a lot of functions for analyzing text and finding bits of text and parsing text. And one of the more common functions we use is the position function. And what it does is it finds where in a string of text other characters appear. In this case, we're looking for the letter I in this is a test. But we see there's two I's there. So I'm asking for starting with the first character in the string, the T, tell me where the first I is. So where's our first I? One, two, three. If we look down below, we get a three as the result. But what if you put in a negative value for which letter I you're looking for. Hmm. But notice we changed the starting position as well. We said length text field. And length of text field is how many characters are in the string. So it's actually the position of the T. So starting with this ending T, give us the minus two I. And minus two means count backwards. So from that T, it goes up, first I, second I, so that's at position three. If I change this to a minus one, so first I, it comes to from the end, right there. So now the result changes to six. We now have the sixth character. So position can also go backwards. We can, just like characters, we can work with words. So here I can do a middle words of the quick brown fox. I can say, hey, starting with the third word, give me the next two words. In this case, that would be brown fox. Third word is brown. Give me two words, brown fox. We can do middle on just normal characters instead of words. In this case, starting with the third letter, give me the next two letters. So our third letter is A, B, C, so the next two letters would be C, D. We have a left function, which, so if you're starting with the last or first character, you can always just use the left and right function. You don't have to use the middle, but they can give you the same results. Here we're asking for the left two characters of John, J, O. Filter is a great function. It lets you take one big text string and filter out all these characters. So in this case, I have all the numbers in here, zero through nine. And as our text string that we're filtering, we've got a bunch of numbers and text strings up there. And it just brings out all the numbers for us. It, the filter lets through what you ask it for, okay? But filter can be a little tricky because filter, if we look at this one, is actually case sensitive. Notice the uppercase T did not come through because it's not in my filter text. But if I change these to all uppercase, T, Q, B, maybe, and we look over here, now we see they come through because there's a capital T, a capital Q, a capital B. So filter is case sensitive. You have to remember that one. Okay, time field. Oh, what are we gonna do with a time field plus 60? Well, time fields to FileMaker Pro are really just number fields, but we define them separately as a time field so the FileMaker Pro knows how to display them to the user. But in the background, FileMaker Pro is really just storing a number. And that number is the number of seconds since midnight, okay? And here we're adding 60 to it. And what is 60? 60 is 60 seconds for one minute. So if we took 10.23 p.m. and we added 60 to it, we get 10.24. And since I'm displaying that as text, FileMaker Pro puts it into military time, including the seconds for us. If we display the result as a number, we actually see the number of seconds since midnight. If I had a result time, we could use the layout formatting tools to display the time however we want. So it doesn't show seconds, it shows AM or PM. So you have control over that 
And that all comes because we define the field as a time field. Eight. So the date function lets you take three numbers and turn them into a date. And dates, just like time, are stored as numbers. But what is our zero point? Our zero point is day zero of month zero of year zero. So we're currently in year 2020. So we can see what's going on. So we use the get function here. So I said for the month, give me the current month, add three to it. Then give me today's date, today's day, and today's year. And so if we look at the answer to this one, we see that it is 11, 18, 2020. So we added three months to today's date. So let's do the same thing, but let's take the day of a date field, the month of a date field, and the year of a date field. Well, parameters are important in their order. And the date function would like the month first, then the day, then the year. It works off an American calendar display. So the first thing it wants was the month. So we actually put the day into the month slot in our formula up there. But what is month 13? Well, it's really month 12 plus one, which rolls over to January, and it bumps up the year by one. So it becomes January 2020. So FileMaker Pro knows that if you put in math in the month and the day and the year, it knows how to roll over and get the correct display. So in this case, we said the 13th month was really January with one added to the year. So it knows how to do carryover in date math. And this can be really helpful. So here's that same formula, but with the parameters going to the right fields. So it works right. So we have month first, then day, then year. And that, that works out normal. But what if we put a zero in for the day? What is day zero of a month? And we're adding one to the month. So we took today's month, 2-28-2020. We added one to the month, but we set the day to zero? What is that doing? Well, that's the last day of the month of the date in the date field. So day zero is really day one minus one. So it did the carryover. It decremented the month. And it gave us the first, the last day of the month. So if you add one to the month and put the day to zero, you can get the last day of a month. And notice it even works for leap days and leap years. All that good stuff. Um, the calc engine around dates is just wonderful with some of the stuff you can do with it. And again, it's the number of days since day is zero when displayed as a number. Okay, so here, here's that same formula, but simplified without all the math cluttering it up. So we said, hey, month three, day zero. So this should be 2, 29, 2016. So you can see here how FileMaker decremented the month to get a day and put us to the last day of that month for the zero, 2, 29. Okay, there is another classifications of functions built into FileMaker Pro. We spoke briefly about them earlier, and those are the get functions. And I think there's something like a 200 get functions in FileMaker Pro, and they can really help you a lot when it comes to learning about the environment your program's running. In this case, it's get device, and this tells you the result is one, so you can see I'm using a Macintosh. Okay, so you can figure out what kind of device you're running on. Very nice. Very nice. 
There's a Get Documents path. So this will tell you for your current logged in user who's running FileMaker Pro, where is their Documents folder? In this case, it's on my hard drive in the Users folder in Tim. There's a folder called Documents. Another great design get function that we can use is the get record modification count. And what this function tells us is how many times a record has been modified. And this can be useful, particularly if you have people accessing your database through APIs or PHP, other methods that don't lock records. So a user over an API downloads this record. And maybe it takes them 15 minutes to decide or edit their changes before they resubmit an edited version of the record back to your system. Well, in that time period that they're editing, another user may have come along and modified this record and seen that it's changing. And when they do that, this count increments. So if you send down to them through the API, the record modification count, when they resubmit, they send that count with them. And if that number has changed, you know another user has modified that record in the time they had it. And you have to make a decision at that point, do I overwrite the previous user's edit with what this API person had? Or do we tell the API person, hey, in the two hours you had that record before you resubmitted it, it was edited three times. You know, I, I can't take your change. Here's a refreshed version of it. Go ahead and tell me if you still want to edit it. So the get record modification count can be very helpful when you have multiple methods of editing records that don't involve record locking. Another great get function, which most everybody's using now, is the get UUID. This helps you get a very large number that you can use for your primary keys that are unique across tables. And this is great for setting up synchronization systems because you know when new records are made remotely, they won't have serial numbers that match other serial numbers in your system. You can get rid of all that duplicate stuff and resyncing of numbers. And a new function that we have, which is very powerful, is the while function. And the while function is used for making loops inside your calculations. It can look a little overwhelming, but let, let's break this function down. So it wants a set of initial variables, which are formatted just like our let function, square bracket, define your variables. It wants a condition. You have to have an exit condition. When are we gonna end our loop? In this case, we're going to end our loop when count is less than 10, okay? Then you have to have some logic. It's like, hey, here's what we're doing for that loop. We're going to do this a whole bunch of times. And here is the result. When it's done, what do we return after we do our logic? And so if we look down here, we're getting 10. As I said, hey, when count is less than 10. So we're taking, we're incrementing by one, boom, 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 boom. And then we're returning the result down below. So the while function is a wonderful way to do loops now. We used to have to learn something called recursion, and that was a little theoretical for a lot of folks, and it got very hard for some people, and it was very easy to break FileMaker Pro with recursion recursion because recursion took up a lot of memory and this one doesn't so it's much faster so it's a very cool very handy so I hope I was able to help you today understand how the FileMaker Pro math engine works and you learned some of the gotchas and some new tricks you didn't know before I highly recommend as I said at the beginning that you spend some time going through all the functions available to you you don't have to totally know how to use them and what all the parameters are, memorize the order. Just know that they exist. And when you need them, you know where to go now to learn how to use them. Thank you very much and have a wonderful engagement.